Welcome to your 20-minute podcast with David Brower, where we do our best to give you useful information in 20 minutes or less. Now, here's your host, five-time Voice Arts Awards nominee, David Brower. Thanks, Alan. This is David Brower with your 20-minute podcast. Our special guest today from Palm Springs is Stephen B. Howard. He's an author of the book, Better Decisions, Better Thinking, Better Outcomes, How to Shift from Mindful to Mindful Leadership. Decisions are the lifeblood of companies and organizations, and everyday leaders uh, and employees even make decisions in loaded by stress and overloaded brains and interruptions and insufficient time. I mean, the list goes on and on, on and on. Welcome to the show, Stephen. How are you? Thank you, David. I'm very well. Yourself? Very well, thank you. I'm fascinated by your book because everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of people uh, are, are using the latest buzzword, which is mindful. And uh, and how I love the title of your book because it's how to shift from mindful to mindful leadership, and that makes all the sense in the world. So how did this uh, how did this book come to you? And I know it's not your first. You've got what another twenty books you've written, I think. Yes, that's correct. This is my twentieth. Uh, it came about um, partly personal. Uh, my father was suffering from from Alzheimer's in his latter years, and I was his key caregiver, so I started studying Alzheimer's. And then I, quite frankly, just started thinking about how does that apply to leadership mm -hmm. and came across some statistics from a societal standpoint that just scared the hell out of me, quite oh frankly. Huh. And, um, yeah, so I started linking the two and linking um, the ability to be present, which is mindful, yep. with leadership and with decision making. And it all came together. And as a result, the book came out in November last year. My gosh, that's uh, it's amazing to me how they I mean, people call it different things, but how the stars align to where you just go. Oh, thanks, Dad. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind yeah, of, it's, it's kind of a weird city. thank you, but thanks, Dad. <laughs> oh yeah, my gosh, yeah. what a challenging time, well, and and what a what a wonderful uh, outcome for leaders around the country. It, it is, and it's as I said, it's a side of issues. Well, leaders need to be aware of it. Um, right now, projections say that dementia, Alzheimer's, and stroke in this country will increase by sixty-seven percent in the next decade. My God, and that will. We'll have over 10 million Americans suffering from one of those three brain illnesses, and that it's that's inexcusable. Uh, all of these are postponable, perhaps even preventable through lifestyle changes, but right. people are just not aware of it. They think of these as old timers' disease or retirement diseases, and I'll, I'll worry about it when I retire. But yeah, yeah. I worry about it is when you're in your 30s and 40s. Yeah, I've heard it called uh, old timers, part timers. Uh, it's just. It's terrifying, and I don't care how old you are. You, unless you're, unless you're still eighteen, uh, you are uh, susceptible to these kinds of things. And to to turn that off in a obviously an overcrowded brain to focus on things that may be helping to cause these things is that's kind of frightening, actually. It it is, and what leaders do is I coach leaders now about this is that. We live in a world where we just react to everything, mm -hmm. and, and we try and get so much done so quickly. And so I now tell leaders, look, the reason we call emergency personnel first responders is that they're taught to pause and evaluate the situation. They just don't go rushing into burning buildings or rushing in when they see an electrical wire or something being electrocuted. They have to make sure they don't harm themselves or others. Well, the same thing with leaders. We, you need to, leaders need to slow down ask better questions, and become more present before they just make a decision because when our brain is overloaded, when we're tired, when we're stressed, the brain works on autopilot, and it just makes the easiest decision that comes to mind, and often that's the wrong decision. What a wonderful comparison. I mean, that is so spot on that I, one of our sons is a firefighter, and that makes perfect sense to me, and it's a perfect piece of advice for students, employers, C-level entrepreneurs. I mean, everybody. That's It's just a... That's something that we should all do. You know, we should all embrace that pause and slow down, even if it's for a minute. Otherwise, we're going 100 miles an hour and we're not doing what we want to do. We are. Instead of being first reactors, we need to become first responders. There you and go. the interesting thing, David, it is um, our mothers in some ways are right when they taught us to count to 10 mm -hmm. when we're angry. Mm -hmm. It takes the prefrontal cortex, the rational center of the brain, about 10 seconds, 8 to 10 seconds, to take over from the amygdala, which is the emotional center of the brain, okay. when we get angry, we get emotionally upset, we get emotionally hijacked. So even as little as 10 or 15 seconds is enough to calm ourselves and start thinking rationally. And that's all it takes. I think we've all been in a situation where we said, I was too angry to think straight. Yeah. And that happens so often, so often in today's world. You know, I don't remember my mom saying that. I'm sure she did because... 
actually, now that I'm older, I practice that, um, and I don't know why, uh, but I actually practice that most every day, and uh, it is a calming thing that I don't know where it came from, but I appreciate that mirror because it's. I'm fortunate to be able to do that right now. I'm sure certainly didn't do it 20 Good years ago, but I do it now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think I did it before I did the research for the right? book. But I'm like you. I do it regularly now. Right. Yeah. It's like okay. Where's my instant gratification? What do you mean we're a, a dollar under profit? I. You know. It's like oh my god. It's so yep. challenging. And when you work with uh, with business owners, entrepreneurs, those kinds of things, you work one on one. Do you work in groups? How does how do how do you educate these people and help them be better at what they need to be? I do both. I do a lot of team coaching, eight to ten people, all reporting to the same person. So the team gets together and we talk about these things. And then afterwards, that's usually my entry point mm-hmm. to an organization. And then afterwards, I work with individuals who need more help or who want more coaching and. Uh, that can all be done virtually. That, the beauty of technology today is you don't have to fly everywhere to, to have a coaching session. So I, I do both. Yeah, thank goodness. So when you, I'm curious, when you start with a team, uh, well, first of all, how, do, how does the team come to you or how do you find the team? How do you get, how do you get that entry point? A lot of referral business, mm-hmm. quite frankly. I've been training leaders for 25 years. I've trained over 10,000 leaders around the world in the past 25 years. So a lot of it's referral business. That's the best kind. People, now with a book, obviously. Yeah. yeah. With the book, uh, I, I have a, a leadership blog. People people read that three times a week. Nice. And there's a lot of leads come in. Nice. So I'm curious about the team concept because it seems to me in some scenarios, teams are going to be made up of uh, different generations, uh, different, uh, obviously different ages, different um, challenges, different responsibility. I mean, how do you get a team to coexist in a good way, I guess? Communication, number one, mm-hmm. um, and trust. Trust is the underlining it. And, the, and that trust, and one of the things about leaders today is that they need to learn is that leaders need to learn that trust is based partially on vulnerability. Mm-hmm the ability to stand in front of the team and said, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what we should do. Let's talk about this. Or or even to admit a mistake. Hey, I've made a wrong decision. Now let's figure out how we can correct this. Yeah. And if you notice the words I'm using, I'm using a lot of we language. Yes, you so are. If the more leaders can talk about we, how are we going to work on this? Where are we going? Uh, those are the two main reasons uh, to get teams working the same way. And the third reason is, the third way is for leaders to understand that they need to trust their team. Yeah. They need to let go. They need to delegate. Um, leaders should set strategy and let the team worry about tactics. There you and go. And that's what great leaders do. Well said. And I like what you said about we. There's no place for I. There's no place for you. Uh, there's every place for we. And, uh, and yeah, I can see where that would help increase the trust on both ends of that from the team uh, uh, to the leader. Do you find in your in your coaching, your training with some leaders that their, their ego is just too big to do what they need to do? Yes, sir. Uh, unfortunately, and and those are the leaders who burn out, or more importantly, one of the leading indicators of that is they have large turnovers of their team. Oh, um, yeah. You know the old saying that pe- people don't leave companies; they leave bosses, mm-hmm. and that that's so true. Yeah. Particularly in today's world, uh, you mentioned the multi generational world. I mean, baby boomers are less likely to do that. Millennials they'll leave, and and um, they won't even tell you that they're leaving. This concept called ghosting now is happening oh, in the yeah. workplace uh, more frequently. Yeah, I've heard of that. What what is that exactly? I've heard of it. Ghosting on a in the it, it started in the dating world. My understanding of it, and just basically you break up your relationship. You just don't contact the person anymore. You don't respond to them. Well, ghosting in the employment is you just walk out the door and don't come back. Oh you know, my! You gosh. know, you might give up part of your paycheck. You you don't worry about referrals. You go get another job and. You move on, and and a lot of ghosting is happening frequently, particularly in the larger organizations. That's terrifying. I mean, you go from, <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, you go back in the day, what, 30, 40, 50 years ago, whatever, uh, where loyalty was really important on both sides of the equation, owners, leadership, employees, all that kind of stuff. And then as time went on, lo- loyalty became less and less and less. But to to go to that extreme of ghosting – I mean, I've heard of people quitting their jobs by texting. I've never heard of ghosting. Oh, my yep. Lord. <laughs> I can't even. Yep, they just move on. My brain can't even go there. Oh, goodness gracious. I'm going to have a talk with my grandkids, I'll tell you. <laughs> there you go. Well, it, it, it's something in the younger generation. It's not something that you and I would probably ever consider doing, yeah. but uh, it, it is happening, and, and it's 
driving HR people and, and small businesses as, as well as large businesses. It's driving them crazy. Wow. Your book has a section on brain myths. Uh, what, are, what are a few of those that uh, you were surprised to discover in your, in your research? Uh, one is, um, I know, again, when I was growing up, I was taught that our brain stops growing when we're, you know, somewhere around age 25. Mm-hmm. Um, and that science can prove that's no longer true, or actually it never was true, but now science can prove it, in that the technology with the MRIs and other technologies that have, we continue to grow brain cells into our 70s, and our brain volume can actually continue to increase wow. into our 70s if we take care of it from a health standpoint, yeah. if we have bad lifestyle then that's going to impact the brain. Um, one of the worst things for long-term brain health is being overweight, quite frankly. Sure. Um, another another research study came out that showed that people who were highly overweight have smaller brains and that men who put on the most abdominal fat in their 40s have a higher risk for dementia in their 60s. Oh, my goodness gracious. And we all hear, I mean, everywhere you turn in every piece of media, there's you got to look like this. You got to feel like that. You got to be like this. You got to do like that. And I mean, how do you sort through all that when your brain is already so mindful with your employees and the job to to give yourself enough respect to take care of yourself? I'm sure a lot of people don't do that. They don't, and and that's why I've got a one day workshop on this that that organizations absolutely love because we get a group of people in the in the room and either cross functional or all the same team and we just we work it out and I give them tips and techniques on how to change their lifestyle how to how to change their breathing patterns to reduce stress in the workplace oh, yeah. uh, other tips to uh, to reduce stress because the other leading indicator of brain illnesses is, is high blood pressure yeah absolutely absolutely I found this thing my wife is I call her the uh, the stud of the family she's the jock I mean she gets up at 5:30 in the morning and goes swims 3500 yards cuz she wants to and um hikes and does all this great stuff and I'm going yeah whatever I want to ride my Harley you know and so <laughs> I can't do pilates I can't do yoga all that kind of stuff but I found this class called chair yoga and I am freaking hooked on that class you know it's like chair yoga chair yoga so it's like yoga in moderation you have a chair that you use to help with your balance, and it's all stretching, and it's all uh, all yoga kind of stuff. It's just in moderation. And I, I'm going, oh, my Lord. It's just fascinating for for guys like me that are, you know, we're about as flexible as a, flexible as a pencil. And um, it's a fascinating class. I just, I'm crazy about it. And so if you, uh, I love oh, it. yeah, it's, oh, my goodness. Anyway, I'm raving on here. Um, so. No, it's great. Um what I know stress overloads brains, which impacts decisions. I know if you're going hundred miles an hour, like you were talking about earlier, how do you how do you differentiate between good decisions, bad decisions? You just jump in the pond and make a decision, which isn't gonna help anybody. So one of your things is you have to figure out a way to help these people become um, those emergency responders. And that's that's gotta be a challenge. It is, and a lot of it is, you know, it's all the body. What happens when we're under stress, the body produces cortisol. Cortisol triggers the emotional part of our brain, mm-hmm. the amygdala, and then the amygdala takes over, and, and that's why we get emotionally hijacked. We say things that we later regret, or we do things that we regret, or we make decisions that are wrong. So one of the first techniques I teach people is, is, is a technique called body um Box breathing, sorry, called box breathing. Okay. And it's what the U.S. Navy SEALs use. And all it is is you inhale for five seconds, hold it for five seconds, exhale for five seconds, hold the exhale for five seconds, and repeat for a minute, two minutes, whatever. And all just that breathing, and it, it's obviously belly breathing, right. it's from the diaphragm, right. deep breathing. That breathing alone forces the cortisol out of the system or slows it down and allows the, again, the rational part of the brain to take over. The Navy SEALs do this in five minute increments. Um, you know, and I don't know any leader who has a more stressful job than a Navy SEAL, quite frankly. Exactly. So, um, so, and if they do, if they do, they should join the SEALs. That's fascinating. And it's, it's something everybody, everywhere, any situation can adopt, take the time to experiment with and, and make it a part of your daily routine. I mean, if you can't breathe in and out, if you can't commit to breathing in and out in an appropriate manner, you really got to slow down. Well, the most stressful place I go to, and I go to it frequently, are airports. And, oh, yeah. And I will literally 
when I'm standing in line to board a plane and there's you know, loud you know, people yelling and screaming or running around or somebody's had a flight delay or, you know, it's a stressful situation right. for everybody or you're, and your flight delay. I will stand there in line and I can just focus on the tarmac. I usually look at one of the workers or an airplane, just focus on mm-hmm. it. And I'll stand there for five minutes and, and, and do box breathing. And nobody knows what I'm doing. They just think I'm looking out at the tarmac. That's awesome. That's awesome. They yeah. they so they is, teach us that is. in the chair yoga class I was talking about. So you you look oh, nice. yeah you look straight ahead, find a point, and uh, and that's how you help control your balance. So I love that. I'm box yeah. breathing. I'm gonna yeah. I'm doing some other stuff, but I, I love that. I love that. So are you traveling a yeah. lot? Or are you are you doing the webinar kind of stuff, or the I shouldn't say webinar, but the the online kind of training? Uh, it's a mixture of everything. Um, I, I do travel probably 40% of the time right now. It's, I, I usually don't start traveling till March, kind of March to November is my heavy peak travel oh, period. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I do some webinars. Um, I do some free webinars about just brain health in general every couple of weeks. Um, I, and right now I, I've been doing some keynote speaking at some conferences some leadership conferences. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a mixture. I'm just trying to get the message out nice. to people about the importance of, of helping ourselves. Because, you know, I don't want people to suffer what I did as a caregiver right. for my father. That's I exactly mean, the emotional right. and financial costs of looking after a parent, uh, an elderly parent who has a brain disease, is, is just devastating. Yeah, it so is. trying to help others not not do that. Good for you. Good for you. So people want to reach out to you. Are you on the uh, all the usual social media, as they say? Everything except Instagram. Uh, <laughs> no Instagram and no and no Snapchat. I would guess. No, no Snapchat. I get that kind of, I'm not in that younger generation. I'm sorry. But, uh, um, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Stephen B Howard. Stephen with a V and an N. Stephen B Howard. You can find me on LinkedIn. The same thing. Stephen B Howard. Uh, uh, location: Southern California. Easiest place is my website. Uh, my company's name is Caliente Leadership. Okay. So Caliente leadership.com and caliente of course is a spanish word for hot yep. but people don't realize it's also a spanish word or one of the definition of it is passionate oh wow and i'm passionate about leadership i love that so that gives me a chance to explain that so yeah. caliente leadership.com that's where my blog is at that's where my, my contact details are at and so, some uh, of your some of your free uh, free information is on there too right that you were talking about i've got free articles yeah. on there every month i post um, 10 to 15 articles I've read by others in the last month on leadership, nice. and I, I I post that on a page and put links to the articles so people can do it. And I've got a, a list of recommended leadership books um, by myself and others. Perfect. Yeah, so and, a lot of free information. And on that Caliente place. is C A L I E N T E A T E rather C A L I E N T E leadership Caliente re- leadership. And you've got 20 books out there. Your latest, of course, is the one where. We're talking about better decisions, better thinking, better outcomes, how to go from mindful to mindful leadership. One of the ones titles I'm, I really want to check out, it's called Eight Keys to Becoming a Great Leader with Leadership Lessons and Tips from Gibbs, Yoda, and Captain Jack Sparrow. I mean, I got to check that out. <laughs> well, the, the, that is one that the younger generation loves. It's a short I book, bet. It's only 130 pages. Yeah. I, I kept the price down below $8, but it's, uh, I take scenes from Gibbs, the TV show NCIS mm-hmm. on Tuesday night. Yeah. So he's your he's your command and control leader. Yeah, rule, rule ninety nine. Yeah, yes. Yoda is your philosophical leader from Star Wars, right. and Captain Jack Sparrow is your get into situations and get out of situations and take leader. a and take a uh, bottle of so, rum with you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> folks, be sure to look up Stephen. Fun book. It sounds fun. I'm gonna check that out. It, uh, be sure to look up Stephen B. As in boy, Stephen B. Howard, and you can Google him. You can find him on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, all those kinds of great things. And, of course, his website is calienteleadership.com. Stephen, it's been a real pleasure, man. Congratulations on your success and uh, continued success. Uh, the box breathing, if folks don't pay attention to just that, uh, that's a home run in and of itself. Well, I appreciate it, David. Thank you. And I'm going to go check out yoga, chair yoga. That sounds interesting. All right. Have a great day. Listen to your 20-minute podcast with David Brower on the go. Downloads are available on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, any podcast app, and on our website at davidbrowervo.com slash your 20-minute podcast. Until next time, thank you for listening.